part of your revolutionary duty is to fight. And we are not ashamed if the need arises for us to take up arms and fight. We'll fight. Treacherous and seditious, that's how the ruling party is describing the words of an opposition leader in South Africa. Is Julius Malema using the country's dark past to pave the way for a political future? And what do young South Africans think of their emerging leaders? Hello and welcome to this edition of Inside Story. I'm Martine Dennis. Julius Malema, the firebrand leader of the economic freedom fighters in South Africa, is not a man to shy away from controversy. He's an aggressive advocate of the rights of poor black South Africans, rights he believes should be claimed by force if necessary. Now, he used to be hailed by President Zuma as a future leader. Now, he's arguably the most outspoken critic of the ruling party. The ANC is suing him for comments he made to Al Jazeera, comments the ANC says amount to treason. Let's listen. Part of your revolutionary duty is to fight. And we are not ashamed if the need arises for us to take up arms and fight. We'll fight. The, this regime must respond peacefully to our demands, must respond constitutionally to our demands. Lest we find ourselves charged with misinterpreting your words yeah. when you say you are willing to take up arms. Yeah. That's what you said. Literally. Literally. Against the government. Yeah. Literally. I mean it literally. We were not scared. We're not going to have a government that disrespects the and Constitution. And on what basis, w w what are the circumstances in if which you can if imagine If they respond violently, arms. if they respond violently to our peaceful so protest. So you, 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 you envisage reacting in self-defense? We are a very peaceful organization. Yes. We fight our bat battles through peaceful means, through the courts, through parliament, uh, through mass mobilization. We do that peacefully. But at times, government gets tempted to respond to such with violence. Yeah. They beat us up in parliament. And there's a long history of And they, they send soldiers to places like Alexander where people are protesting and, say, and, 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 and will run out of patience very soon and will remove this government uh, through a barrel of a gun. All right, let's bring in our guests then. They're all in Johannesburg. Uh, first of all, Umbuseni and Dlozi, who is a spokesman for the economic freedom fighters. We have Kanti Pai, who is an economist as well as head of research at Nascent's Advisory and Research. And joining us via Skype is Hlonyapa Mokwena, all of them in uh, Johannesburg, as I've mentioned. Can I start with you then, Umbuseni? Was it helpful, your leader, Julius Malema, um, uttering comments that the ANC, the ruling party, has called seditious, treasonable, and now legal proceedings have, have been launched. Is it helpful to the EWF calls? Well, um, we, 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 we are an opposition party. We have a responsibility to speak the truth, to challenge the government of the day when it does illegal things. But we have a responsibility as well uh, because we are a political and revolutionary party to always um, and at all times inform uh, our people the extent to which we are willing to go to defend their dignity and their right to life. And therefore a question was posed uh, to the Commander-in-Chief on Al Jazeera platform in relation to the increasing levels of violent response by the regime. It is a matter of fact the ANC government killed people who were protesting for water in Mututlung, in Relela. It killed people in Marikana. And they stole elections in Klokwe, which is just outside Pochifstrum. They also, when there was a disagreement in Alexander in 2014 about the outcome in several voting stations, they not only, they didn't just send the police, they sent the army to silence dissent. And what the Commander-in-Chief was explaining is, if needs be, if such a trend continues, we will be forced 
to take up arms as many, many revolutionary organizations across the world, including the ANC themselves, that when a regime moves beyond reasonable means, constitutional and democratic means of resolving social dissent and begins to erode the right to life of people, then the, we're in a constitutional crisis and we've got the right to defend ourselves. Uh, sounds, we've got the right to engage in an armed struggle. The kind of language that you're using as well sounds very much as though you don't believe a revolution has taken place the revolution of South Africa that happened, that culminated in 1994, non-racial elections for the first time. It sounds very much as though you see yourselves as being a, 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 a paramilitary force almost. You've got a commander-in-chief, you wear military uniforms. Is that how you see South Africa today, that there is a battle still to be fought? No, I think you've been looking at the wrong EFF. We don't wear military uniform. We wear red berets and overalls, which is workmen's suits. Um, and uh, we don't, we don't, we're not armed. We don't have an underground self-defense unit. We believe in the freedoms and the rights and the political uh, benefits of the 1994 outcome. But we are also conscious increasingly that in this country, the ANC government is undoing those political freedoms. It is undoing them because it is failing to articulate economic freedom freedom to millions and millions of black people whose dignity has not been restored, land, who are unemployed in en masse, who are unable to find proper schools, who still live in townships the same way they were under apartheid. So we are conscious that as they protest daily, demanding from what is a corrupt ANC government, what they are met with all the time is death. What they are met with increasingly is a violent government that kills okay. them. Can Being I, can conscious I take, of that, can I stop we, you there and we are take, just saying what we are prepared points. to do. Kanti, um, as an economist and as a young person in South Africa today, what do you make of the EFF's argument? Look, I mean, I think it's very interesting, and I think there are some very important and strategic parts. Um, I think particularly if you listen to the whole um, of the interview uh, and really some of the messages that is probably coming through, um, you know, speaks uh, of, of some of the tendencies that have been coming through. And, you know, I mean, obviously we are still a very young democracy. Um, the ruling or the governing National African National Congress, uh, you know, has, you know, might have some tendencies, I suppose, in a way in which uh, these kinds of organizations tend to live uh, through their lives. And so in a sense, I think the FFF is sort of putting them notice to say, look, we've seen what happens to, to uh, liberation movements over time. We've seen their tendencies, especially as they tend to, as they start to slip from power. And so some of the excesses that they have, and I know, you know, if people watch through uh, some of the things that have been happening in South Africa and Parliament and the rest, um, it does suggest that we may have some of these tendencies. And I suppose, uh, you know, the EFF wants to put the government on notice to say, you know, um, time is uh, going through. We can see um, some of these tendencies where you are starting to slip you, uh, in yes, terms of uh, you sound, the polls Kanti, and you might be you tempted so, to you use sound, some you of sound these very other much as, You sound very much as if you have a great deal of sympathy for the manifesto put forward by the EFF. Do many of your friends and associates of the same generation, do they share that? Do you think the EFF is actually... Uh, is actually accepted and its role in South African po politics today is a useful one. Look, there's certainly no doubt um, that the FF uh, occupies a very important part in terms of the evolution, both in the political and the economic sphere uh, in the country. Now, also globally, I mean, you'll realize, for example, some of the things that we're seeing through Greece, how the so-called leftist movements or the socialist movements are gaining some uh, traction given, you know, uh, some of the difficulties that we're seeing economically and politically. In South Africa, just yesterday, we received some numbers coming through um, from the Ministry of Labor talking about the lack of transformation, for example, in the inclusion of black people in the corporate sector, in leadership, in business. Um, we continue to see some of that inequality coming through, and it's a big concern for young people uh, in South Africa. So certainly, uh, you know, the FF feels in that space quite important at the moment, and I suppose in that sense one can use the word sympathy. But I think it's much more of a understanding of a political system and economic system in its evolution, and saying perhaps, you know, people are starting to get excited about some of the, of the nuance or the discussion that is coming through from various parties and I suppose in this instance what the EFF uh, is starting to talk about. And Cloanape, the ANC does stand accused, doesn't it, of, 
of betraying some of the original mm. promises made, the uh, promises to provide basic services to all people of South Africa and indeed to improve the lot. And yet, as we know, we're talking about unemployment among young people, uh, around 35 per cent uh, for black men and 46 per cent for black women. So the ANC really stands accused of having failed uh, its main constituency. So I just want to start off by saying that obviously for those of you who follow South African news, um, this is not the first time that the EFF um, has threatened violence or Julius Malema has threatened violence. Um, when he was still a member of the ANC, he threatened to kill Fuzuma. So I think his comments, his latest comments on using violence to achieve his political aims should be seen in that context um, as being a second iteration of his uh, kind of, yeah, his very violent rhetoric. Yes, I mean, if you think about the EFF as a response to the failure of the ANC, then yes, there is something to be said about how powerful um, the rhetorical um, influence or the rhetorical impact of the EFF's words um, are in South Africa. But if you think about it from the perspective of what is actually possible from an economic perspective, um, then it is not surprising that we are having the kinds of problems that we are having, unemployment, um, the failure really of the welfare state as it exists in South Africa to achieve social change. It's not that the ANC is not doing anything. I think sometimes the debate gives the impression that South Africa, there's nothing that's being done for the poor. Um, and that's not really a true reflection of current social policy in South Africa. A lot is being done for the poor, but it's simply not enough. And Mbuseni, uh, you're still talking about radical uh, economic transformation. What specifically does that mean for the South African economy as it stands today? Well, I think that uh, at the center of <clears throat> the ways in which the last 22 years of ANC's rule has conducted the economy is the reluctance for an active state participation in the economy, the capacity to start industries from scratch. Any developing country in the world, the many examples uh, lie in the East Asian Tigers, or what is called the East Asian Tigers, but as well as America, as well as uh, Britain itself, nobody ever developed uh, by opening themselves up to the rest of the world's trade. You've got to have uh, protectionist policies that protect local and small industries and the ANC is refusing to do that. They don't do that. They are unable to protect local talent so that it grows and becomes competitive in terms of the world. And investors are not coming en masse, particularly on labor intensive industries such as televisions or electronic gadgets and many of the things that we eat. We still depend a lot on the rest of the world to eat. And this needs a decisive corrupt free government that knows it has to drive the economy like we we see in China, like we see, like we saw in the early days of Korea, of Japan, and 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 that's basically what the EFF is saying is that we've got to constitute an active state in the economy that protects the economy that goes tough as well on aggressive tax avoidance and transfer pricing. All right. And all these things are not be, are not happening in the ANC, but beyond, it's just a bunch of corrupt old people. Okay, and let's put that then to our economist, Kanti. What do you think? Does that, as an economic manifesto, make sense to you? Does it sound like something that could gain traction, particularly uh, as, as we're in the run-up now to those critical elections, which are local, but will be a great barometer, won't they, of political strength in South Africa today when they come in August? Look, I think uh, there are two things uh, to be said about the economic management uh, of the ANC. The first part is that unlike, you know, in many other countries, including China, for example, uh, the ANC found an economy that actually was well developed, well built, and was fairly, fairly, you know, capitalistic in its outlook, even though it may have been a closed, in econ closed economy due uh, to sanctions. So that was a very well developed economy, but also very exclusionary. And so what they've had to do is to try and find some way to actually open it up and to expand it. So many of the problems that we are facing in this economy uh, is the dominance of some of the bigger corporates actually 
try, you know, sort of keeping out smaller budding, uh, you know, companies into this. Add to that, obviously, the opening of the economy and then the entrance of global players. Uh, and that has been one of the bigger mistakes in terms of sequencing uh, policy and development in South Africa from uh, democracy that all has sort of all right. know, left a lot of industry okay, and new so players vulnerable you're concurring, to the ravages. You're so concurring. it's a bit difficult for Aren't you, yeah? with Mbusenyi, you're concurring to a degree. Now, uh, we, we don't want to just limit this conversation uh, to the EFF in South Africa. We also want to look at uh, the other uh, newish young uh, leader. He's the main opposition leader, uh, Musi Maimani. He's the black head of a traditionally white party, the Democratic Alliance. And here he talks about the kind of leadership a new generation of young South Africans is demanding. The struggle meant different things for different people, and I'm less inclined, I'm, I'm, I'm equally inclined to say there is a generation of South Africans who perhaps didn't live the majority of their lives under apartheid, but are still feeling its effects today. How do we collectively work with that generation to go forward? So I think for me, the key emphasis must be, I celebrate people like Chris Haney and that generation and ask the question, surely there must be a generational shift of new leaders who are then inclined to take South Africa forward. And so not all of us can hark back to the struggle. We honor it, but we also recognize the fact that I think what South Africa needs today is leaders who can answer the, the more tougher economic questions about the prospect of tomorrow. All right, let's go to Klonapla now to find out what she makes of uh, Musi Maimani. Is he convincing for you? We, we've heard quite a lot, haven't we, about the possibility of him merely being a black figurehead leading what remains uh, a white uh, political party. But what do you make of him and what do people of your generation and of your circles make of the Democratic Alliance as it is today? Well, I think what is really happening in South Africa is that there's a leadership vacuum. And the real question is, who's going to fill that um, leadership vacuum? Is it going to be Julius Malema? Is it going to be a Zuma successor? Is it going to be Musi Maimani? And I think part of the problem with thinking about what leadership in South Africa would look like at the moment is that, number one, as you can hear from the list of people, it's still very much male-centered. <laughs> so again, there's still an assumption, really, that somebody who's a man uh, is going to come up with South Africa, the solutions to South Africa's problems. And then secondly, I think this whole youth uh, versus older generation question is also part of the issue. Um, and it's to do with people's disappointment uh, at some level with the old revolutionaries. Because again, they've all stopped being revolutionaries and now they are government ministers and politicians. And I think for many young South Africans, there's a just a kind of general disappointment. I mean, if you think about it photographically, if you think about photographs of South African revolutionary uh, movements from the 1960s and 1970s, and you look at the same people now sitting in parliament in suits and ties, that uh, kind of disjuncture between the two images is leading many young South Africans to sort of reject the old leadership as if, number one, all of them are bad and corrupt, as um, Guiseni says, and number two, as if none of them actually have anything to offer in terms of advice. And again here, it is about young people's impatience, if one can put it that way, generally speaking, with all forms of political, quote-unquote, stability, if I can put it that way, because I think that's what we have now in South Africa, a kind of stasis, maybe that's a better English word, a kind of um, um, stabilization equilibrium in which people sort of know what to predict, even though there are still new things that still come up. So I don't think that Musi Maimani is going to be able to challenge the legacy of the ANC as he wishes to, but it's still exciting to have new and younger people um, coming up as leaders. And Umbasenyi, um, what uh, also stands out about the language that you use and indeed that we've heard from Julius Malema is the language that harks back to a different era. It sounds like the language of the liberation struggle against apartheid. It sounds very much as though it's rooted in perhaps violent upheaval as indeed was, was deemed necessary uh, all those years ago. No, I mean, I think... You know, Nelson Mandela, when he was um, a sitting state president, he told a gathering of workers uh, in 1996 in Johannesburg that if the ANC did to you what the apartheid government did to you, you must do to the 
ANC what you did to the apartheid government. And um, we, we, we have to be critical. We have to sit at the cutting edge of conscientizing society that any government that can kill people with immunity uh, is no longer the government of the people because the right to life is fundamental to any society. And it is a fact that people in Marikana were massacred. Not even one politician in the ANC sitting government lost their job. People in Mututlu, after Marigana, people in Mututlung, in Relela, who were protesting for water, were killed. And none of them, none of those politicians have lost their jobs. So increasingly, we are experiencing an ANC that is aggressive, that is self-entitled, and that is willing to kill people. And all we are saying is if this trend continues in a liberation that is incomplete, where the land has not been redistributed, most of the economy is owned by white people, most of the black people are unemployed, those who are employed are cheap and easily disposable black labor. In that type of a situation, you kill people. If that trend continues, we will be forced, and that's the tough reality, to go underground, arm ourselves, and engage in a struggle. Idi Amin was a post-colonial leader. Mabutu Saseko was a post-colonial leader of degenerated liberation movements. So if this movement of Nelson Mandela must stop from not being degenerating, it ought to respond to the demands of the people genuinely, stop corruption, and respect the Constitution. All right, Candy, there's a long list of accusations of, uh, against the ANC. Has the... Uh, the, the love affair, if you like, the sentimental attachment to the ANC, which uh, we know has been in existence and carried it through with thumping majorities at every election since 1994, has that love affair started to fade? Look, I think there's something quite important here about this divide between the older people and the younger people and the youth, but also at the same time when you think about this love affair, if you listened uh, to Julius Malema speaking, you could have actually been listening to Nelson Mandela speaking in the 1940s, you know, about a government that, you know, constantly delivers violence against the peaceful people and that sort of thing. And it's quite interesting because I suppose while trying to deliver, you know, new outcomes and new kinds of thinking, there's always a sort of hark back into the old, into those heroes, because that's still very, very important part of our, our social and political life you know we still very much I mean the even the leader of the of the of the DA continues to go back there and draw heroes from the from the uh, from the ANC to try and gain some legitimacy to try and sell their message going forward so it's quite interesting that there are those two things and also at the same time you know I mean some of these messages are also important in the sense that you know people who are watching from the outside investors are listening and also in a very important way engaging and one is always wondering whether or not that sort of engagement you know whether you watch uh, Julius going overseas or not is part of um, part of a very long-term uh, discussion around where South Africa goes and untangles itself even from its old and current past. Um, Klonyapa, can I give you the final word and, and if you could make it brief, please? It sounds very much from where I'm sitting that South Africa has not evolved uh, in the way that Nelson Mandela uh, envisaged and hoped for, and that is it's still a, a very divided, uh, polarized society, and that racial fault lines still exist. So I think our, our institutions of government are actually much stronger than people make, out, they make them out to be. But the social issues that the EFF is touching upon are the ones that the ANC itself, I don't think, has a solution to, precisely because they are intractable problems. So, for example, we certainly point to the fact that the majority of black people still live in the townships. Well, what is the alternative? Because you can't really erase the townships now that they are there. You can't really again, forcibly remove people, bring them closer to urban areas, bring them closer to their places of work. And so the solutions, like, for example, having a good and working public transport system, are things that are slowly being rolled out in South Africa. And again, they are, they are there. They're, it's not as if people aren't trying to bring about a proper and, and functioning public transport system. But it takes time. It takes time to build a public transport system in order to bring people closer to their places of work. So I would say that, yes, South Africa has multiple problems. We are a society with many fault lines. But every day, millions of people wake up and they try and make the country work. And I think the EFF is being kind of disingenuous with this kind of suggestion that it, they want to be violent in order to respect human life. I don't know if you can square that kind of equation, especially in the current 
um, South African context. I don't know if South Africans are willing to again throw their lives at a revolutionary movement just in order to prove their humanity. Okay, we have to leave it there. Very interesting conversation. I'm afraid uh, we, we've run out of time, but uh, can I just thank you, Tlonyapa Mokwena, uh, Kanti Pai, and of course, Umbuseni and Lozi. Thank you all very much indeed, and hopefully we can have this conversation again after the elections. And as ever, thank you for watching. You can see the programme again anytime you like on our website, aljazeera.com. For more discussion, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Martine Dennis, and the whole Inside Story team here in Doha, it's bye for now.